go. Okay. Well, we started last week was what really happened on Azuzu Street. So if you weren't here last week, you're going, what? And what we did last week was we presented the modern day uh, uh, participation and growth in what's called the charismatic movement and how it happened on Azuzu Street. And we went through the history of that a little bit and we saw that what really caused it to take off was an earthquake, an 8.5 on the Richter scale. And of course that was, uh, we're talking turn of the century, um, the time frame here. Um, that earthquake was uh, 1906. And what happened was there was already a Pentecostal uh, charismatic movement being taught. Um, and without going through it again, it ended up in LA in on Azuzu Street where the people met. And what happened was this earthquake 8.5, it, it was a killer and it was big across the world, uh, this earthquake. And so talk about the San Andreas Fault. See, that's where why everybody talks about it because of that earthquake. So this is when they immediately hit the pavement, these folks, with, with uh, literature, you know, concerning what was to be a revival of the church. We could have these manifestation signs of Israel that were in the early church, the body of Christ, which we'll discuss. And there was to be a revitalization of the Acts 2 site program. And so that thing hit the ground. And it got to the point where people were pilgriming around the world to come to Azuzu Street, where this thing took off in its modern day form. And so we were studying that. So we went to 2 Peter chapter 1 because there, what is Israel? The Jews require what? Ever since Moses, right? Moses went to the Hebrews in Egypt and. What was it that demonstrated he was of God? Three miracles. Okay, sometime we'll study those three miracles. There's a lot of foundation there. But he had three miracles, and the Jews require a sign. What about the Greeks? Wisdom. Wisdom. Okay. And so what they want to do is revitalize what happened in Acts chapter 2 with the manifestation gifts that were designed to bring the good news of the kingdom on earth coming at hand to Israel on the day of Pentecost. And what's their idea of revitalizing the church? Sight. We need more to see. We need miracles see. We need to evidence that God is with us. And God is part of this. And so this happened on Azuzu Street. So if anybody says Azuzu Street to you in the church that you're listening to, you'll know what that means. That's really the modern day birth of the Pentecostal movement. Okay, so we went to 2 Peter. If the Jews require a sign, and Peter's talking about what? Did he get a sign? Did those three guys get a sign? James and John, his brother, and Peter. They got a sign. What was it? They saw his kingdom glory on the mount. They saw him, what he will, how he will be manifested in the kingdom on the earth. That's what they saw. And who's he? He's talking with folks, with saints, right? And he's talking with what? There's no time now. What's the difference between Moses and Elijah? How many thousands of years? How, how many years? And, and the point being that, there they are both at the same time talking with Christ. Why? Well, it's a picture of the kingdom on the earth. That's what they witnessed. And when they say, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, I mean, his face, his countenance outshined the sun. It was the countenance of the sun and his raiment. That's his kingdom glory. He's light. And here's the point. They say, we didn't make this up. These aren't cunningly devised fables. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
Now here's the point. In a site program, let's see what trumps what in a site program. Does the site trump the Word of God in the Kingdom program? Take a look. Go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Notice how this verse starts out. So he just recounts something that they were privileged to see before it would transpire. How long has it been now? The kingdom was, was at hand then. How long has it been now? Two more millennium? So they saw something in their lifetime that was coming. And what did they see? Their hope. That's their hope, a kingdom on the earth. That's the purpose of the prophetic program is God restoring his rule and authority through his people on the earth. Um, take a look at 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. What's more sure than that manifestation to their sight of his kingdom glory? What's more sure? Written. I see the word more sure. More sure. What's a better uh, source of truth? The eyewitness account or the Word of God in a sight program? The Word of God. Notice it keeps going. It says, whereunto you do well that ye take heed. You better take heed to this. Okay. Because some people are going to have cunningly devised fables and try to do what? Pull the wool over your eyes. He says, when there came a voice to him from excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So what do we have? verification from the Father that this is God the Son. And he says, um, verse uh, 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy, okay, it said prophecy up in verse 19, word of prophecy. Now you go, well, that's verbal. Well, that's true. There was verbal prophecy at this time. In other words, it's progressive revelation. It was continuing. Until Paul, and there's a back cover on the book, notice, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the, what's that say? Scripture. Just to reinforce it. Graphe, writing on the page, is of any private interpretation. You don't excerpt. So we got two things going on here. One thing is, you don't excerpt a verse and then start to try and interpret it and understand it, divorced from its context. Okay. You know preachers do all over? They take passages and they subjectively interpret it. When do you know when you're in a healthier situation? When people are comparing scripture with scripture, letting one, every verse explains another verse, another context. you got immediate context, you have, what, a more remote context. You have a remoter context. But that context keeps the dominoes going down. And there's no scripture that you should privately interpret. You go to most pulpits and they're privately interpreting the passages. I think, well, I think, well, you know what I think? This is the typical form of Bible study these days. Do I really care what I think? Do I really care what you think? Or do I want to know what God thinks? <laughs> it's nonsense. It's nonsense Bible study. Okay, It has no place in the church of the body of Christ. Yet, it proliferates. It proliferates. You know you're in the wrong place when you see that going on. I am in the wrong place. Even in this site program, you don't privately interpret Scripture in any program that's going on. You're with people that know nothing about the Word of God. Because what we're talking about is how, to, in time past, was there a prescribed way in the tabernacle to approach God? What happens if you violated that approach? Oh, you're dead. You had to approach God the right way. In theology, what do they call it? Hermeneutics. How do I approach the Word of God? What interpretive 
uh, principles do I employ to understand the Bible? What's the first one? You might say compare scripture with scripture. What's really the first one? Believe the gospel of the grace of God and receive what? God the Holy Spirit, our teacher. When you have God the Holy Spirit, what is how is he going to lead you to understanding that produces absolute resolve? The full assurance of the understanding that you just gained. Comparing scripture with scripture rightly. Okay, you gotta, you gotta get a Bible, you gotta get the truth, and then you need the Holy Spirit, and then you need somebody that can, you know what that makes a preacher? In a manufacturing operation, uh, what's at the bottom? Maybe not the bottom, but anything so. An assembler. Now we have robotics, you know, but an assembler. You know what a preacher is? You know, you know what Solomon was? Ecclesiastes? The study of human wisdom there in literature? It means the master of assemblies. That's all you are is an assembler. I assemble the word of God so folks can understand it. Well, not a big deal. Just assemble it. And do then what? Follow what God says. Rightly divide it. You don't have to go willy-nilly. I mean, is there a big difference between a sight program and a faith program where you only go by the, the Word of God understood? That's a big difference, isn't it? And even in that program, does the Word of God trump the sight? You might have saw it, and the Word of God says something different. Where do you go with it? Okay. Now, is this true in our program today? Take a look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And take a look at chapter 14. Paul is answering questions in 1 Corinthians that the Corinthians post. And a lot of it is just a flat-out rebuke of their conduct and behavior. And one of the questions is in chapter 12 through 14, what about spiritual gifts? So Paul's going to talk about spiritual gifts in the church, the body of Christ in the first generation, where manifestation gifts, sign gifts, were still ongoing. Okay? What was that? Where manifestation gifts were still ongoing. So what is he doing? He's saying, here's what they are. Here's how you handle them. This is the most important gift. But let me tell you something in chapter 13. You hear chapter 13 at weddings. It's despicable. And what do they call it? Love. What do the churches call it? Love. The love chapter. Are you insane? This is not talking about marriage. What's it talking about? What's the most predominant? Out of three things, there's three things. You can go to 1 Thessalonians, and these three, three things have um, uh, uh, verbs in front of them. But what are they? Faith. Love and hope. What's the most important? Charity. Out of the three, what's most important? What happened on the cross at Calvary? What he did for us? How we are now incorporated in him and his purpose with and in him in the heavenly places. 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about the design for the edification of the believer, grounded in love. Marriage. What happens when you what happens when you identify it as something else? You don't know what it's talking about. You miss out on, let's see, out of these three, what's the most important? Charity. What'd you just miss out on then if you think that's marriage? Let's not too th think too much of ourselves, okay? <laughs> okay, look at 1 Corinthians 14. Paul says this. Verse 36, what, came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? Are you the only ones at corn in Greece receiving the word of God? Are you the only ones where the word of God is coming out of? 
Are they speaking prophecy in the other churches? New Testament prophets. Why? Why did you need a New Testament prophet? Thus spake the word of God. Thus saith God. Why did you need it? Because the word of God wasn't finished. It wasn't finished. So did they have to wait till they got the copy of the scriptures written by Paul? They did not. Why? People could could do what? Speak what God would produce as scripture before the scripture was on the page. Is that useful? In other words, I only have what? A part of it. I don't have all of it. So the gift of prophecy did what for the church of the body of Christ? It helped them. It helped them. Notice Paul says in verse 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, remember chapters 12, 13, 14, what about spiritual gifts? Let him acknowledge, you acknowledge this, that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. What's he saying? Scripture over what? The gift of prophecy. Scripture. What's on the page? So what does that imply? What's Paul implying there, Corn? Some people are doing what? Making up, making up prophecy. Because they want to be important too. Somebody says, I want everybody to see me. I want everybody to acknowledge me. I'm important. Listen to this. They make up something. It helps their agenda, their personal agenda of engri and uh, great miss the word engrise. Sorry, of glory. Let's just say that. Okay, there are a lot of that going on. Uh, a lot of people need attention. Yeah, they're insecure. Why are they insecure? Yeah, because the way things go now, parenting the whole bit, right? Now, so Paul says. In our program, where we walk by faith, he says scripture over what? In that first generation. The spoken word of God. The written word of God does what? Yes, but what does it do? We, you got the spoken word of God here and the written word of God here. Maybe a guy spoke the word of God and then Paul later wrote what? To Corinth, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And so what happens when you get the word of God from Paul? It trumps the prophecy. If the prophecy is different than what Paul wrote, discount it. Discount it. Was that helpful? Why? Because of bad behavior. Bad, bad behavior. You know how much bad behavior is going on in the church, the body of Christ today? I ain't talking about religion. There's a lot of bad behavior out there. A lot of bad behavior. So what do you got to do? Who's, who says, does God say, here's the church you need to go to? Does God say that? What does he, what does he leave up to you? Whatever you want to do. He holds you responsible. Whatever choices you make. What should you, so you go, well, how am I going to do that? There's a bunch of nutcases out there saying everything and anything. Not saying what God says, but what they want you to think God says for their glory, for their what, generally? What are we talking about? Scratch. Money. You know? I want to make a living doing this. Did Paul make a living preaching? Why should you? If the apostle couldn't make a living preaching, why should you? What did he do to supplement it? New construction. He's a contractor. He's a tent maker. Isn't that what people lived in? You know, some lived in houses, but tent people were mobile because of their 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 herds, etc. But but here's the thing: is I now have a governor to keep me on. To, you know, I went through. I went like this. I went from this church to this church to this. You know how I what, what kept me forward, moving forward understanding. If I couldn't understand it, do I have to believe it? Romans 14 says to the weaker believer compared to the stronger believer, weaker believer, follow what? Understanding. Be persuaded in your own mind. 
Now, if you don't care about understanding, you care more about you. <laughs> what you, I, I like this, I, I like that, I like, do you like the Word of God? Do you like understanding it? We're talking about how to approach God. Paul's giving you some instructions here to that first generation. Now, there's folks that say they're speaking the Word of God today, and you go, see, you go like this to them. I did this. See that? They put it on the back of a book. It means what? It's done. When I put a back cover on the book, is it done? No, that's pretty simple. <laughs> I'm just trying to get it across, you know? The book's complete. Does Paul say he completes the Word of God? You know where that is? Take a look at Colossians. Now, why am I bringing this up when we're talking about what happened at Azuzu Street? Because what happened at Azuzu Street can be addressed and corrected and rebuked. Rebuked and corrected. Okay. Colossians, look at chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 24, well, verse 23. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be moved to, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard. Now, when you get involved with covenant theology, what are you involved with? Are you moving away from the hope you have in the gospel? Our hope is what? Ephesians. Heavenly places. When you get involved with covenant theology, what are they singing about? The hallelujah chorus, mom. What's that singing about? Kingdom on the earth or a kingdom in heaven? Kingdom on the earth. Okay. Who's, who loves singing that? The religious of covenant theology. That's moving away from our hope, the hope of the gospel. He says, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature. You got any excuse? Preached to every creature? Any excuse? No. Which is under heaven. Hereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Who's our apostle? Paul. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. So he's able to rejoice as he waits in this present evil day. The sufferings of this present time. And fill up that which is behind. What's he fill up? Uh, you know, it's like somebody, somebody pours some wine for somebody, you know. And they only do half a glass. And then the guy goes like this. Fill it up. He says, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for, ye, for you to do what? Fall, fill, fill the glass. Fulfill the word of God. Who puts a back cover on the Bible? Paul. Doesn't he just say right here he fulfills the word of God? He fills it up? Now you go, wait a second. Paul's last epistle is what? Philemon. And then you've got these Hebrew scriptures that follow. They're the end of the Bible. The Bible's not in what? It's in doctrinal order. It's in doctrinal order. When John saw the Revelation concerning the end times, the grand central station of the prophetic program on earth, was that, was that after Paul? No, chronologically it wasn't. Now the church plays all kinds of gymnastics to try to make these things happen, but you can, what you want to do is internally uh, uh, ground your chronology, okay? Internally in the scriptures. Scriptures allow for that. It's in doctrinal order. Okay. Now, because people don't rightly divide the scriptures, they think that those Hebrew epistles are written to who? That's covenant theology, see? That's covenant theology. And if you get involved with covenant theology, it says, and if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away 
Move, Burp. Move away from the hope of the gospel. So what are you doing? You're saved? And what are you doing? Are you going towards your hope, the heavenly places up here? No, you're going like this down here. Where's that going to get you? Second, you're not involved with what God's involved with today. How pro is that profitable? No, it's bankruptcy of your spirit. It's total spiritual bankruptcy. So don't use the name of Christ around me as it refers to what he's doing today. You're doing something, but it has nothing to do. The wisdom of the wisdom of this world is doing something, but it has nothing to do with me. Quite frankly, get off that pulpit and sit down. Can you do that today? No. Are we to do that today? No. How do we get people to step off the pulpit and sit down and learn? By preaching the truth and understanding. Because there are those that want to do what? Follow understanding. The principal thing, Proverbs 4, 7, is wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom. Wisdom, God. Wisdom. And with all thy getting, get what? Understanding. Does God expect you to move for him without understanding? And I mean resolve in your understanding. I mean you've dropped all the counterfeits. And you're following what you understand. Should you believe what you don't understand? I, I had five or six guys down in Florida beating on me about a passage in Hebrews and going to the Greek and stuff. And I sat there for five hours like this. And you know what I said to them finally? Because I kept asking questions and they kept going around in circles, not answering the questions. So I said to them, you know what? I'm going to go play with those kids. There's a bunch of kids over here. And I'm going to go on the floor and play with the kids because I don't have to believe it if I don't understand it. You know, I'll give them the fact that what they think you're smarter than me, right? I'm ignorant and you're smarter than me. But here's what I have as a governor. I, if I'm not persuaded in my own mind, I have to believe it. You remember that, okay? Somebody that's pressuring you for resolve in time, in a short period of time, to be what? A confederate with them as to what they're teaching. And you go, nah, it's not really how I do it. The way I do it is I have to be persuaded in my own mind. That's how I do it. So I don't have to believe you. Well, what could they say? These were grace believers. So, huh? And ah, what could they say to that? Nothing. I want to go and play with the kids. Five hours was enough. I poop. They're trying to tell me what Greek says. And I, do you speak Greek? Do you write Greek? If you do, any of you speak or write Greek, what are you at, like second grade? <laughs> I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? I mean, all the Greek experts can't agree about Koine Greek. So I don't understand what you're doing. You're just weekend warriors that are going to these, you know, you, you got this kind of a thing, you know, right here, you know. The New Englishman's Hebrew Concordance, you know, uh, what was I looking for actually? I can't get it because there's things in the way and they'll fall down. I was looking for an in, the inner inner linear that I have, which is the Greek and then an English translation other well, under it. So what are they really doing? They're creating a new translation. Well, I think what I got in my hand is better than what you produced alone. I'm not going to go through the Bible issue here this morning. But this was hardly produced that way. If I were to look at how this was produced and what you produced, you know what I'd say? What That's garbage, and this is what I'm going with. This, this is God's way of doing it, what produced this in English. Okay? Along with other languages. But here's the deal. We started this study to address this movement that now is one of the largest movements in, West, in Western civilization. Okay. Uh, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We ended with this last week. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Can you live in this present time, present evil time, it says in Galatians, without suffering? Not possible. I mean, even if you've got some kind of personal peace and affluence that continues to the day you die, what happens all around you? Other people suffering, and what What are you going to lose? Loved ones. Because of what? What's our number one in it? Mortality, death. Okay. Is there anything more painful to people than that? No. So, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed with us. Let's not set up an illegitimate comparison. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What's the creation waiting for? The kingdom on the earth. What happened when Christ preached the revelation of the mystery to Paul? He just did what? Put off the end of their redemptive calendar and there's one week left. So did that mean restoration to the earth was going to happen? No. Not right then. How, how long has that been going? From generation to generation to generation, and here we are 2,000 years later. Notice, he says, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. So, did, we, did, did, the, did all the creation willingly want this suffering? They were subjected to it by who? Adam and Eve and the adversary preaching on a vine pulpit. And it says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage, that's the creature, animate creation, the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's going to happen on the earth, but is it happened yet? No. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves, what? Are believers exempt from the suffering, like many preach. Like if you pray, you can get your circumstances that transpired in the wrong direction changed by God. God will go like this, in, 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 to the circumstances. Your circumstances do not dictate your spiritual self. You are not to interpret them, your circumstances, and the way they transpire. As to the health of your <coughs> spiritual being in Christ. Because you're designed to do what by God? Endure the sufferings of this present time. And not only they, but ourselves also. Till we suffer along with the rest of the creation. I mean, when the antelope's sitting there going, He's eating me alive! <laughs> right? Notice. Which, uh, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Do we have the first fruits? Yeah, we got the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Could anybody see it? And I remember when I was a kid, and I was a new believer, and I, I didn't know anything. So I'm reaching out. I'm looking. I watched, um, uh, I, I didn't go to school that year, and I was working, and I was in my brother's room, and I was watching one of these uh, 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 Pentecostal evangelists. And he's out there, and he came down off the pulpit. He's down in the aisle, and they're bringing these sick people to him. And this woman, woman comes up, and supposedly she's blind. And he goes like this. I'll give you a double dose of the Holy Ghost. Like that, she falls down on the ground and she comes up and she goes, I can see. Well, what you don't know is they assembled a bunch of people, took them in the back room. They want to see who's going to go with it. Yeah. I don't know what they used to make them do it. 
But who's to say she could sit, you know. Can anybody walk around like this? I remember this little guy. His dad, uh, Sam knows who I'm talking about, Stu. His dad, Jeffrey and Stu. You don't have to know those names. But his dad had, I he lost his eyesight for a while there, and he had an operation and all. And so I was at, I was he was at this place at a pool on a deck. And so I'm watching him, and he's going around like this with his eyes closed. You know what he's trying to do? Yeah. Empathize what his dad's going through. And he's doing it for like five minutes. <laughs> that little guy. And so the point being is that that's not how God's working today. I mean, that's how a circus works. What they used to call it way back in the old days? Carnival. Carnivals. You know what the word carn carnal, carnal means? Fleshly. And what were they? Oh, the fat man, the strong man, the bearded lady. Yeah, yeah. It's a car it was a flesh show. That's what that is. That's a flesh show. And you know what? It isn't really happening. Why don't you go where there's a lot of blind people and get... Oh, what are you doing just taking these people that come and, and what pay the money to get in the door? I don't know what's going on. Or pay the money after you get in the door. Why don't you go to those places and clean them out? Oh, it's the faith of the person that's coming to be healed. You know, you get all this mumbo jumbo. And um, what do you got to straighten it out? Because when I was young, young, I did, I'm susceptible to this, right? What do you got to straighten it out? Somebody that will come along and do what? Give you understanding in his word. Better yet, tell you what he's doing today. Here's the passage, what it says here, and this is important. It says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan, just like the rest of them, the animate creation, within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. What are we waiting for? A new body in the heavenly places, Philippians, fashioned like unto his glorious body. And then are we going to play, be plagued by this body anymore? No. No. Good answer. <laughs> For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not what? If you think you're going to interpret what God's doing today on the basis of sight, what do you have to know? Then it's not hope anymore. If you can see it, is it hope? For what man, a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do, here's the bottom line, then do we patiently wait for it. What's this program all about? It's preaching of the revelation of the mystery. What's it all about? Waiting. Patience. Waiting. Is, is, the day when he assembles all the generations of the church, the body of Christ, that have been born and died and are present with the Lord, that day has not happened yet. Is it very possible that you die waiting for that day where we're going to do what? See that two wit up there? The redemption of our body. We're waiting for that day. Are there saints in heaven? Generations of saints in heaven waiting for that day? They are. But they're with the Lord now. But what are they waiting for? They're not a trichotomy, are they? They're a dichotomy. <laughs> they're a deuteronomy. They only got two parts. Okay? Now, as a young Christian, I was asked, did you receive the second blessing? And I'll do this and finish here today. Did you receive the second blessing? And I went like this. What's that? What is the second blessing? What kind of people um, teach that doctrine? Pentecostals. Did you receive the second blessing? You might be saved, but did you receive the second blessing? Because that's a proof of it. Because the proof of it is, can you do manifestation gifts? That's a proof of it. Have you received the second blessing? Uh, I go, I'd have to lie to say yes, wouldn't I? I say, well, no. Then it's like, oh, well, I'm just going to 
how, you know. Okay, but here's the thing. If you look at John chapter 20, where does that doctrine like that get going? From the Bible. From the Bible. What does the adversary use to preach? What did the devil use in the garden to preach? The word of God. He used the word of God. He used the word of God with Eve and Adam, and he used the word of God with the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't he? He quoted out of Deuteronomy three times in Matthew chapter 4. He uses scripture. What do religious people do? What do Baal worshippers do? Let's call them Baal worshippers. Okay? Because it's the same thing that's been going on for millennia. And you go, well, you're trying to say they're dirty dogs? No, I'm just trying to identify what the Bible calls religion. It's worshipping other gods. Okay? Um, and specifically who? The adversary. Through a complicated system of idolatry, you know, that you can study for a long time, follow that trail. Now here's the thing. Uh, in John chapter 20, take a look at verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. Where'd they get this second blessing thing? John chapter 20, <clears throat> verse 21. Then said Jesus to them, he's risen from the dead, okay, and he appears to them, his own, his disciples. Then said Jesus to them, them again, peace be unto you, as my father hath sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he did what? He breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Uh, when the Lord made Adam out of the red silicates, we call that clay. And he was who's the first sculpture? Sculptor, the Lord. And what did he sculpt? Um, this wonderful, amazing body. And then what did he do? Did he just put it up on a pedestal and put it in the, in the square in the town and charge him a fortune to buy it? He did what? He breathed the Holy Spirit into them. Glenn and I have been studying back in Genesis and beginnings, foundations. And here's God. He creates the critters one by one. And then you know what he does? He parades them in front of Adam to see what he will call them. It's like they're, they're what? They're buds. They're buddies. And God's saying, enjoy my life with me. And it says he wanted to see what Adam would call him. We call that what field of study today? Botany. No. That's plants. Zoology. Zoology. I took two of them. I took, I took zoology 101, and then I took invertebrate and vertebrate. And I was constantly drawing diagrams. And the guy I had in vertebrate, oh my God, you couldn't get a 10 no matter what you did. He didn't like the size of your lettering when you were labeling parts. He didn't like the arrow. There were maybe a slightly different angle by two degrees. I mean, it was nuts. But my point is, God brought him before Adam. There's the first zoologist. He wanted to see what Adam would call them. Isn't that participating in what he'd done with man? He breathed the breath of life in them. They received the Holy, he received the Holy Spirit. Well, this happens in John chapter 20 again. What happened back in the garden? Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Take a look at John 14. John 14. He told them he was going to do this. John 14. Look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. John 14, verse 16. That he may abide with you for <laughs> ever. Even the Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be what? In you. I will not leave you comfortless. 
I will come to you. So what's he telling him? Well, we just read in John chapter 20. Okay. Take a look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Receive ye the Holy Ghost, it says in John 20. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come unto you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria unto the outermost parts of the earth. Now, is this after John 20? Yes. What day is pending? What feast is pending? The Feast of Pentecost, right here. 50 days transpire since the resurrection. Notice he says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come unto you. Well, wait a second. Didn't the 12 already get the Holy Spirit? Didn't he say receive the Holy Spirit? What's this? Is this a second blessing? Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of the harvest. And he spoke to the disciples, the little flock. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come unto you. And you'll be witnesses unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Hence tongues. Foreign-born Jews among the nations came to Pentecost. They came to these four feasts. And this is one of them. And they come, and what language they speak? Different languages. How could you communicate rapidly the Word of God? Because different disciples spoke different languages to different language groups. Do we know that for a fact? Yeah, take a look. Verse 8. Verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? And how, most of them were, yeah. And how hear we every man in his own tongue wherein he was born? Are they speaking other languages miraculously? Yeah, language is being healed. Who created language? God. And he's healing it. Verse 8. Verse 9. Now it makes a list of all the foreign-born Jews that came to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. See the list there? Even proselytes from other places, down at the at, down in verse ten. And what did they hear? Verse eleven, the wonderful works of God in their own tongue. Isn't that what Christ says they're going to do? They're going to go out to the uttermost parts of the earth. How are tongues going to aid them? They're going to be able to speak languages they never learned. Today, in the body of Christ, you have to learn the languages. Is everybody good at that? Doesn't seem like it. <laughs> Somebody says, I know seven languages. You just go, are you from Mars? I mean, I, you know. The point being, is this the second blessing? Take a look at Luke 24. Luke 24. You know, these, these, this apostasy comes from somewhere. And it's always the scripture, privately interpreted. Luke chapter, not rightly divided. Luke 24, verse 9. Luke 24, verse 9. Luke 24, verse 9. Uh, let's see. Verse 7 says, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into hands of sinful men and be crucified. And the third day rise again, and they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Okay. Um, what do they have to wait for? In Jerusalem. What do they wait for?
Look at verse 49. What are they waiting for in Jerusalem at Pentecost, until Pentecost? Notice verse 49. And behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with what? Power on high. Is that different than receive the Holy Ghost? When they received the Holy Ghost, did anything happen that we read about in John chapter 20? Other than now they had the teacher and they could remember the things that he taught during those three years, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what's added here? Power. What's power in that program? Nicodemus comes to Christ and he says, No man could do the miracles that you do except God sent you. What's power? Miracles. Miraculous happenings that can be seen by sight. Notice it says power on high. Take a look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and look for, look at verse 4. We'll wind this up here for now. Acts chapter 2. And look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what filling in, in that program meant? Miraculous activity. Specific miraculous activity that each of those miracles represented something. Tongues, the Davidic covenant. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So, could you tell you received the Spirit of the power on high? Could you see it? Well, what does it say? Verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. So that's number one, mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. You know, like the clo a cloven hoof. And those things were what? And it sat upon each of them. So fire, wind, fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Why are tongues important on Pentecost? Well, all these foreign-born Jews, and they want to communicate the wonderful works of God. Because Pentecost is just what? Been practiced for millennium, and now it's being actualized. With the coming of the Holy Spirit on, with power on high. That's the second blessing, isn't it? I got the Holy Spirit over here in John chapter 20, and now I have the ability to do what? Miraculous activity. So the Pentecostal says to me, have you received the second blessing? What is he waiting for? Now, if I was smart, I could have taken him to the scriptures and said, well, what about the mighty rushing wind and the cloak of fire? If I can do some gobbledygooking, you know, it takes some, I can't even do that. I'm, I don't have that kind of brain where I can take syllables and so many syllables in a certain number and then repeat them. I'm not good at that. But, I mean, there's people that can do that, you know. You know those fast talkers on the radio that give you all the, uh, uh, the uh, liability problems, you know, with the drug? And you listen, could cause death, could cause your legs to fall off and your feet, could cause, you know, blind, immediate blindness. And they talk real fast. Why? We don't really want you to hear that. Does it happen to everybody? No, but it could. It's possible. It happened. Now, here's the thing is no mighty rushing wind, no cloak. And that's not real tongues, because tongues are what? Not the language of angels. They're what? They're spoken languages in the earth. Do you know the passage that says that? And we'll quit. You see, here's the deal. To be filled with the Holy Ghost is to have the power of signs and wonders, manifestation gifts, seen and manifested first to the nation. You weren't filled with the Holy Ghost without the manifestation gifts, the second blessing, they called it. They call it. Power evidenced by sight. Pentecost belonged to Israel. 
manifestation gifts belong to Israel at this time. Okay, one more passage. Look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Look at chapter 14. Verse 9. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 9. So likewise, ye, ex ye except ye utter by the tongue, words, easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken, if I don't understand the language? For ye shall speak into the air. Mm, that's what charismatics are doing now. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices where? Voices, languages. Can't understand your voice. In the world. Are there a lot of languages in the world? Are there language groups in the world on the continents? Isolated continents from one another, some all together. In Europe, why can they speak three languages? Because they go for an hour drive and they're in another country speaking another language. They're just trying to do commerce. They have to speak these languages, right? Why do people learn English? You know, you meet people that are from other countries that immigrated here legally, some. And what can they speak? Quite frankly, I'm amazed that they can speak English. Because can I, could I speak their language if I went to their country? Why do people learn English around the world? Business. Trade. It's That's it. Trade. It's yeah. the language of trade and commerce. What happens if, if the United States wasn't running things in that regard? We'd have to learn They'd that. speak something else. Why did people speak Greek? And if they didn't speak Greek, they were a barbarian. Because they were not connected to what? Trade and commerce. They were isolated from it by language. So, if you want, is that a pretty good motivator to learn language? Notice what it says. There are, it may be, verse 10, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without what? Significance. People that speak that language can understand that language. You've got some, you know, emotionally governs, maybe saved Christian, gobbledygooking at you. And saying that's the tongues of angels. Guess what? I go back in my Bible. Tongues of angels communicated with what? Different language groups, especially most. They Hebrews. So what they speak? You know that Chaldean Hebrew. There was one language in the earth. That's what they speak. What did God speak in the garden? That language. What did uh, um, the devil speak? The devil, the serpent speak. Same one. They all spoke the same language. What do you mean tongues of angels? I have no evidence of tongues of angels sound like that. Neither have I seen or heard an angel. You see, with the Pentecostal movement is standing on what? A bunch, a bunch of emotionally governed, sight operating, apostate believers. And you know what? Those teachers that are doing that to all those millions, does your heart go out to them? And you know, who's, who's very much susceptible? You know, we all have these different personality traits, um, emotionally governed people. Some are more emotionally governed, some are what? More control they operate with. They're not uh, governed by their emotions. You know, we go through LaHaye's, you know, <laughs> those... You could be melancholic and go like this. Somebody tells you, hey, the house next door is burning down. And you go, yeah, I see that. Melancholic. <laughs> Etc. But my point is this. You need to know what happened on Azusa Street and help those folks trapped in that. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We pray that it would come to our aid as we communicated the hope of the gospel to others. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.